You're listening to Talking to Teens, where we speak with leading experts from a variety of disciplines about the art and science of parenting teenagers. I'm your host, Andy Earle. We're here today with Dr. Jane Nelson, who is a mother of seven, grandmother of 22, and a great-grandmother of 13. She is the author of several Positive Discipline books and the creator of PositiveDiscipline.com and these courses that they do all over the world where you can learn about the positive discipline techniques that Jane has discovered and developed and adapted a lot of them from Adlerian psychology and developmental psychology, which she has studied extensively. So can't wait to learn all about the positive discipline approach, how it works, and how she developed all of this stuff, and specifically what parents of teenagers can take from the positive discipline method to really connect with their teens and make an impact. This is quite a book here, so I'm really excited. I got a bunch of pages that I've uh, marked that have things that I'd be really interested to talk to you about, and so I wonder if we could talk a, a little bit about, you know, I think parents today feel kind of really busy and like there's so much to do and a lot of families having both parents working, and what do you think is the answer? Well, first of all, let me talk about the busy, overwhelmed parent. And one of the biggest things that parents can learn and understand is that this can be a blessing to work so that you can really get children involved in helping. Mm. You know, I was reading the research just last night. I wish I I could have found it where kids used to, when I was raised, you know, I'm 81 years old now. So I was raised at the time when we walked to school by ourselves, even when we were five years old. (laughs) And this study, where did I read that? Anyway, it was saying how children had a lot more freedom outside the home. We let our kids walk to school. We let them go to the playground by themselves. Yeah, yeah, right. Marcella Rutherford. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sociologist. But they had less freedom in the home because they were expected to do their their chores. They were expected to help out. When they lived on the farm, they were it was their job to gather the eggs and to do things from a very young age. But today... Kids have hardly any freedom outside the home, but the kids, are they're being micromanaged inside the home. And, yeah, yeah, right. And the thing is, is that they're not told so much to help and how they can contribute, but they're told to do their homework and how to do their homework and when to do their homework. Mm. And, you know, they just, parents lecture, lecture, lecture. And one of the key things of positive discipline is first understanding that why we do what we do, you know, the belief Uh, behind what we do. And the main belief, Andy, is that children need to feel belonging and they need to feel significant. Now, most people don't understand belonging is easy. We know that for belonging, uh, they need to feel loved. They need to feel unconditional love. But significance is different. And some people think that to help their children feel significant, they give them more love. But to feel significant, what they Mm. need is more responsibility. They need to contribute. They need to feel capable. And we often rob our children of developing significance through the, through feeling capable and contributing to their home, to their school, to society, because we pamper them. We even say, oh, you don't have to, you do your homework, but you don't have to make your bed. You don't have to clean the bathroom. Ah, right, right. So that's one of the main things is that we have to realize that why we're doing what we do, and it's for the long range of helping our children develop the social and life skills they need to be happy, successful people in life. And then the other thing is realizing some people see all of our tools as techniques. Right, now, right. they just don't work if you don't understand the principle behind them. And so a lot of parents and teachers use them to control their children rather than to help their children develop belonging and significance. Right, Huge, right. huge difference. So back to busy parents. Instead yeah, right. of feeling guilty that you are working outside the home, 
see this as a great opportunity to get your children involved in really being significant. They are really needed in the home. They're needed to learn responsibility. That's another way to keep it. They need love and they need responsibility. And we're not giving enough children enough responsible because we think, I don't know what we think, that pampering them, that that it's child labor. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, right. Whatever the thinking is, but it's it's very mixed up. And then the other thing is to get children involved in the process. So Mm. this is one of the reasons why we believe in family meetings. So you sit down and you have a family meeting. And, you know, you have some really good information on your website about getting kids involved in doing chores and how important it is. And one of the things that I would just like to add to all is how important it is to get the kids involved. Uh. We we sat down, we had a big meeting about what are all the things that we need to do to keep our house running smoothly. And the kid, we brainstormed all the things that everybody needs to do. And then this idea of, okay, which ones can children do and which ones can, do parents need to do? And, you know, yeah. you, you mentioned on your website about the chore chart. And you see the rewards, which we say absolutely do not give kids rewards. Ah, right, right. As you, as you point out, because that takes away from their feeling of feeling significant. It's, they just start doing things for the reward. So that is very, very bad thing. But to help them create different kinds of chore charts, they get to be creative mm. and they, you know, there's so many different ways, like, you even mentioned throwing the dice, which I thought was one of the techniques we use. Each chore will have a number. They can throw the dice. Sure. Or you talked about having a spinner in your book also that yeah, you could yeah. spin. Or, yeah. Right. Or having sticks in a can that have chores and they get to sure. the stick. <laughs> yeah, but I, yeah. But I have to tell you, I want to tell you one of my favorite chore stories with my last two, uh, that when the, the others were gone and when I was <laughs> yeah. working and traveling even and, we decided uh, that I would put two chores a day, major chores, on the whiteboard for Mark and two for Mary. And I was really trying careful to be fair and who, who would get which chart. They were supposed to do them when they came home from school. Sure. They started to complain. You know, it's like, how come Mark gets the easy ones? And Mary would say, yeah, how right, right. So finally, I, I just said, well, we had another family meeting, and I said, well, what do you think we should do? How could we solve these problems? And they yeah, said, well, yeah. You just put four chores on the board and first come, first serve. Ooh. So I did that, and <laughs> they, first they were racing home to see who could get there first. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> then totally. They decided, no, no, it doesn't matter. Uh, just take what you get when you get there. But the reason it worked, it was of their idea. Yeah, yeah, right. That is so key to get children involved in whenever there's a problem, what is the solution? And so we and have these family meetings, which are weekly, which I think is the most important thing that parents can do, one of the most. I love that. And that's such a cool idea. The chore chart without rewards can become like a record of your contribution that you've kind of made to the family or whatever and, and reinforce that feeling of significance in a cool way. And I like that the, this idea of family meetings is really powerful. And, and I like that it just allows them to contribute. And you mentioned that we accept things when we feel like they're our idea a little bit. And there's a lot of great research on that. Over and over again, it's been shown that, that it doesn't take much uh, for you to feel like it's your idea. And so I like in your example that it's like, you know, we're still going to use a whiteboard. I'm still going to write the chores and there's still going to be four of them. Like they accept all these things, you know, as being okay. And all they need to do to feel like it's theirs is, you know, kind of choose this one little aspect of how they're written up there or whatever. And uh, it's powerful. You know, it it shows the power of that approach. Well, exactly. And the thing is, is that when they're younger, the chore chart should even be made by them. Just like the wheel of choice should be made by them, where they draw the pictures, they they create it. You know, this is one of the reasons why I don't like the fancy ones that you can buy that are so pretty. And but I like them when their kids have helped create them and they have drawn yeah. the pictures. Crayons and yeah, yeah, right. Can we talk about the idea of kind? and firm. And I wonder if you could just talk a little bit kind of about that and and how it works and how you do it, 
as a parent. Do, do you know the thing that's interesting about that is we keep going back to why we do what we do. And remember, we keep going back to belonging and significance. And so kind yeah. is the belonging and firm is the significance. Ah. It also goes to the idea of connection before correction. And all the brain research has told us mm -hmm. that children do better when they feel better. You know, one of, one of the most famous quotes in one of my books, my first book, is where did we ever get the crazy idea that in order to make children do better, first we have to make them feel worse. Now, mm -hmm. I want that to sink in. Where did we ever get the crazy idea that in order to make children do better, first we have to make them feel worse? And that is what all punishment is based on. Right, right. Make you feel bad and humiliate you, whatever, then you'll do better. And the truth is, for brain science, is that people do better when they feel better. And that doesn't mean that they feel better by getting everything they want. It means yeah, they feel better right. because they feel significant. They're using their power in useful ways. So kind and firm is, mm. I love you, honey, and no, you can't go to the concert today, <laughs> tonight. You know, validating feelings is a really great way to make a connection. Sure, I yeah, know yeah. how disappointing it is to you that your uniform isn't clean. And I have faith in you to remember to put it in the laundry in the future. Or <laughs> uh, I know that you really want to go with your friends right now. Maybe you could get them to come in and help you finish your chores so you can get done sooner. <laughs> you know, it's just avoiding yeah, the yeah, put downs, right. the humiliation, the lectures, let them know I love you. And you still need to do what needs to be done. Because it's like, it's bad enough already, and they already know, you don't have to rub it in that, like, right, they already know that this is a lesson they got to learn, and, uh, yeah, supporting them in it, and keeping it kind, keeping it positive, and maintaining that connection, and we talk a lot about empathy, and just, yeah, the importance of resonating on the same level as the other person for a second before you try to kind of, like, move them to uh, any anything else, I think, is, like, is important, you know, and is a cool part of your approach here. Uh, but also one of the things that really struck me in your book is this idea of mistaken goals. And you kind of have identified a number of these mistaken goals. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you kind of came across those or developed this like idea and then how it works. Well, Andy, I can tell you that the mistaken goals is something that just, that Adler discovered and Rudolf Dreikers and, and yeah. people used to ask, uh, Dreikers, why do you keep put, putting children in these boxes? And he said, yeah. I don't keep putting them there. I keep finding them there. So let's just talk uh, about what they are. It's quite simple. The mistaken goal chart that we have is just so helpful for parents and teachers to remember that there is a belief behind every behavior. So I'm going to come at this a little, do a little background before we get exactly to the goal chart, but the mistake of goals, but and it, again, it goes back to the primary goals of belonging and significance. And okay. since that's the primary goal, when children don't believe they have belonging and significance, and it doesn't mean they don't have it, it means they don't believe they have it. And sometimes they don't, but right. when they don't believe they have belonging and significance, they choose a, one of four mistaken ways to try and get that belonging and significance. For example, well, let's just mention mm. their attention, undue power, uh, revenge, and giving up, assumed inadequacy. So some children might believe, I belong only if I get you to pay constant attention to me. So they get into undue attention. Another right. child believes, I belong only if I'm the boss, or at least if I don't let you boss me. I think yeah, that's yours, right. isn't it? Independence? <laughs> don't yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so, uh, and some, they feel really hurt that they don't belong. And so they go to mm. revenge. I could at least get even. And some people give up. They think, I can't belong. Leave me alone. I don't even want to try. Yeah, and I right. just want to show Andy how the same behavior can be for any four of one of these four goals. Let's take the child who doesn't want to do their homework. They okay. really bug you and say, oh, I can, I, just, just to get your attention. Another child won't do it because they say, you're not going to tell me what to do. 
Another child, and this is one that I'm finding so prevalent today, I'm not going to do my homework because I believe you, my homework is more important to you than I am, and that hurts. So I'm going to get mm. even, even if it hurts me in the long term. Yeah, I right. will not do it because that's a way to hurt you. And then there's the child who is saying, I can't. I really don't believe I can. I just want to give up. And this is mm. because maybe the parent has had too high expectations and they, mm. they're perfectionists, so they either they just have given up. They don't even try. So some children will say, I can't, but you know they can. They just want to get your attention, keep you involved. And the right, other right. child says, I can't, and you know they believe it. And so you do different things depending on, on what they are. So, Andy, I want to give you another right. visual we love to use. We like to use the iceberg. And okay, yeah. the iceberg, the tip of the iceberg is what we see. That's the behavior that we see. And that's what yeah. most people do. What punishment reward deals just with the behavior. Right. In Admirian psychology, we know that there's something much deeper. We know that underneath that is the belief behind the behavior. And sure. that at the very bottom, the primary belief is the need for belonging and significance. So that's what uh, yeah. the mistaken goals delete, uh, address the belief. And I want to throw in another thing. This is why uh, Adler and Dreikers believe that encouragement is the primary way to help children feel belonging and significance, to encouragement, mm -hmm. give them courage. And so we could call this encouragement model because everything we do in a way is encouraging to help children feel that I belong and that I can be responsible and significant. Yeah, right. So then, okay, so can you talk a little bit more about the uh, four of them, I believe? Undue attention. Undue attention. And okay. you know what? I forgot to mention that we should say that everybody wants attention. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's when they, sure. when some people get attention by serving and doing good things. It's, it's when it becomes undue because they, they yeah, need right. to prove their worth instead of knowing they are all worthwhile. The other one is misguided power. And the other thing, there's nothing wrong with power. Uh, well, there is. It's how it's used. You know, power is a, can be a very good thing. And we want right. to help our children use their power in useful ways. Hmm. But it's, it's misguided power when it gets to the useless side. And it's not helping them or anyone else. And then the third one is revenge, where I hurt, and so I'm going to hurt back. And the other one is assumed inadequacy or giving up. And, and when we have our mistake of goal chart, which people can find in the book, is... Uh, it helps parents know how to, and teachers know how to identify based on how they feel, what happens when they usually intervene, and, and the, the very last column is a whole bunch of ideas of how to be encouraging. Yeah. And so this is always our goal, is to use tools or methods that are encouraging to children to help that feel that sense of belonging and significance. Yeah, it's a great chart, and I really did like how you started with what you feel you know it's like if something that your kid is doing is making you feel this way then this is probably what's going on and it, it, it makes it so easy i think to get into it because sometimes it's hard to see things in other people or to know what's really driving their behavior but you know it's easy to know what we feel you know one of the things i like about this chart too is how adults may contribute you know when a child's goal is undue attention mm -hmm. Maybe it's because you don't have faith, your you know, belief maybe, I don't have faith in you to deal with disappointment, or I feel guilty if you aren't happy. <laughs> and yeah. how parents may contribute to misguided power is when they uh, believe I'm in control and you must do what I say, or I believe mm -hmm. that telling you what to do and lecturing or punishing you when you don't is the best way to motivate you to do better. Or for revenge, yeah. the adult may give advice without listening to you because I think I'm helping, or I worry about what the neighbors will think <laughs> more than what you need. And then, of course, the one for assumed inadequacy, I expect you to live up to my high expectations. I thought it was my job to do things for you. So <laughs> for, we really need to look at what we're doing and what that creates long term in children, and it's not about guilt. <laughs> It's about awareness mm. so that we can know, uh, really be aware of what it is we want long term for our children 
And then what are the things that we need to do to encourage them to uh, develop what we hope for them? I like that a lot. We're here with Dr. Jane Nelson, and we're not done yet. Here's a look at what's coming up in the second half of the show. Kids can start doing family meetings when they're about four years old, and they love them because kids go into that. Something happens in their brains and their maturity that they just want to help. This whole idea of teaching kids to think of solutions and get them involved in the practice of finding solutions is just so helpful. And this is why it's one of the best things you can do in families and in classrooms. Yeah, it's powerful. My youngest, was we had created such a good relationship that one day she comes to me and says, Mama, I think I better get drunk at the ninth grade graduation party. And I go, go. You know? What? Oh, t- tell me more about that. Why are you thinking of doing that? And she said, well, a lot of the kids do it. It looks like they're having fun. Mm. And I said, well, what do your friends say about you now because you don't drink? And she thought about it. She said, well, you know, they're always telling me how much they admire me. And they're glad I can be the designated driver. And I said, well, mm. what do you think they'll say tomorrow after you do this? And again, she thought about it. And see, true curiosity questions invite kids to think. She yeah. thought about it and she said, oh, they'll probably be disappointed in me. And I said, and how do you think you'll feel about yourself? And again, she thought about huh. it. She said, oh, I'll probably feel like a loser. And then she said, hmm. you know, I don't think I will. We are so busy imposing consequences, which are really just poorly disguised punishments, instead of Mm. having them to help them explore what are the consequences of your choices. So you use your wisdom and your heart and (laughs) your, your, your goal to help them feel belonging and significance. Yeah, yeah. Want to hear the full interview? Sign up for a subscription today. You get unlimited access to all the interviews I've conducted. It's completely affordable, and your subscription helps support the work we do here at Talking to Teens. Thanks for listening. I'll see you next time.